Well, it is great to be with you today. Uh, whether you are joining us at one of our campuses or uh, joining us online, we thank you for taking the time today. As God's people to gather together, we always expect something good. And that's because our God is good. And I'm excited to be able to share with you today uh, from his word. I believe for some of you, God's got a word of encouragement. And for some of you, um, maybe it's a, a wake-up call. But the good news is, it is a God who seeks your good. The story today happens in the same time frame that we talked about about five or six weeks ago when we looked at the prophet Jeremiah and his story. Nebuchadnezzar, most people recognize his name, he was king of Babylon. And he declares war on Jerusalem, besieges the city. Uh, he ends up taking the king of Judah, as well as, we're told in the Bible, even some of the articles from the temple. Now, that's a big deal. I mean, it's a big deal to take things of worship from the, 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 the temple that God had constructed to, to represent his presence. The king takes those back to Babylon. But he also takes with him a group of people. I want to pick up the story in Daniel chapter 1 today. If you got your Bible, I encourage you to follow along because we're going to read most of this story. Daniel chapter 1, um, let's pick it up in verse 3. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. So Daniel and his three friends are a part of this group of God's people who have been taken into captivity. They're taken from Jerusalem into Babylon. They are living now as followers of God in a foreign land. And that is why so many of these stories of the Old Testament help us out. We who now are people of the kingdom of God, we who have put our trust in Jesus, we are followers of Jesus, but we're living this out in a land that is not our ultimate home. I want you to realize in this story today that nothing that's happening here is passive. This is Babylonian strategy. If you conquer a nation, the best way to do away with that nation is to take the best and the brightest. If you conform them to your way of thinking, then you've conformed the nation to your way of thinking and you have ultimately conquered that nation. It is blatant indoctrination. Now last week we learned together that our learning ought to be based on God's word. That, that's who we are. That, that we call it discipleship. It's following Jesus. It's saying, who is this Jesus and how does he walk this out? We want to learn from him. I want you to understand that the Babylonians are doing the same thing. It's just Babylonian discipleship. It's teaching them to follow, but it's this time teaching them to follow after another God and other goals. I want to stop here just for a second and ask you, do you understand that there is a mainstream media in the culture in which we live? 
that is seeking to do the very same thing. Now, that, that's not a conspiracy theory. I'm saying listen to what is being said media-wise on a daily basis, and then you tell me if that lines up with the priorities and the character of God. And your answer will be no. And so I, I pray that you understand as people of the kingdom of God, you are living in a culture that is teaching you to discipleship, but after other gods and after other principles. Um, for, for some of you, actually, for, for those of you who, some of you are getting ready to go back to college, some of you are a part of college life, some of you remember slightly what that was like. Most every college setting that I know of now, it is a completely different set of principles, of priorities. They're not there to teach you to follow Jesus better. Their main goal on a daily basis is to actually lead you away from him. We need to see that. These young men are about to enter a three-year accelerated bachelor's program at Babylon U. That's where they're at. And here's what's being taught. Babylon University is teaching you a new language, the Babylonian language, not the Hebrew that you've always known. They're also teaching you new literature, the Babylonian literature, not, not what you've always grown up with. That They're going to give you food that is different. We're going to deal with that here in a few minutes and even going to give you new names. So let's just talk names first. Daniel, for example... Donnie, and then L means God, Yahweh, is my judge. That's what his name means. That's his Hebrew name. His new name, given to him by the Babylonians, Belteshazzar, means treasure of Bel. And Bel was one of the Babylonian gods. The same thing is true for the other three given new names. And in each of those instances, I just want to make sure we understand, this is not a case of now you're in Babylon and those names that you've got just kind of sound weird and we don't really know how to pronounce them, so we're going to give you names that, are, that, that really we know how to, right? No, that's not the goal. The, the goal, the goal was to change their identity, the goal was to change who they are and whose they are. It is a deeply oppressive move for Daniel and his friends that instead of their identity being anchored in the one true God, they give them new names so that their identity will be anchored to a different place. But we're going to find out it didn't work. It didn't work. Now, there are multiple reasons why I would tell you it didn't work. Um, one of the reasons is when you read the book of Daniel, if you pay close attention, Daniel only refers to himself as Daniel. He only uses the Babylonian name when he's simply telling the story that, that this is what they were calling him. Does that make sense? When he's telling his story, he, he holds on to who he is as Daniel, who he belongs to in God. But there's also another just little interesting factor, and I, I debated whether or not to even go here today, but I'm just going to tell it to you because I think it's one of those really cool when we get to heaven, I want Daniel to tell me if this is how it is. The original manuscripts of the book of Daniel have an interesting factor to them in that the Babylonian names that they are given are misspelled. Now, not the first time, but as the story unfolds in the book of Daniel, there will be the slightest of letter changes in the, in the manuscripts to those names. And for many, many, many years, scholars have looked at those manuscripts and gone, what is the deal here? Did we just get a, a lazy scribe? Because the scribes would often be 
the ones who copied the scripture once it had been written? Did we just get a scribe who was bad at his job and what's the deal? But the more manuscripts have been uncovered, they continue to go back further and further closest to the original writing. And what they found even from the Dead Sea Scrolls is that every one of those manuscripts were exactly the same. And the theory is, it was one of those little ways that Daniel said, you can try to call me whatever you want to call me, but I'm not even going to give you the respect of writing this name correctly. Not only did they misspell them, but they misspelled them different every single time. And it's almost as like Daniel's going, this is my way of just going, nah, I know who I am and I know whose I am. When we get to heaven one day, I'm going to ask Daniel, is this really what you did? Because this, this appears to be kind of his way of just a jab at the man. My question to you today is, do you know who you are? And do you know whose you are? So that when people try to label you as something else, right? From a loser to the bigot to a liberal to whatever you want to be labeled, right? Whatever somebody tries to label you, do you know who you are and whose you are that you're able to say, look, whatever title you want to try to label me with, that is secondary to who I know that I am through my faith and relationship in Jesus. I am a child of God and no label will ever trump that label. How do you live out that truth? How do you live that out? Well, we've learned in the last several weeks particularly that you got to take some ownership in that. You can't just show up, right, once a week and somebody tell you that. You have to take some ownership in that. You got to be intentional in that. But we also learned that we do that collectively. And some of you need to make sure You have a Daniel in your circle. You need to be intentional about making sure there's a Daniel in your circle. I want to read this story, um, a little more of this story, and then explain what I mean here. Verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of my Lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and he tested them for 10 days. Now, here's what I find interesting in this piece of the story. It says, Daniel resolved not to defile who? Himself. But then his first words to the chief official are, we're going to do this. And there's a part of me that wonders if the other three dudes are going, we? We? Did we, did we have this conversation, right? Dan, it says Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself, and then his next language is, we, we're not going to do this. And I just have to wonder how, how much of that was a, a conversation ahead of time. Now, I'm not trying to read too much into it because we, what we know is there's no indication that, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego pushed back in any way, uh, right? That they're, they're all on board, but I'm just reminding you today, never underestimate the power of one courageous decision to follow Jesus. 
Now listen to what I'm saying. When we talk about following Jesus, sometimes I think people have this mindset of there was this point in my life where I decided I'm gonna follow Jesus. There was this point in my life where I decided Jesus is the savior, he died for my sin, I'm asking him to forgive me. I, I, I want to be his child. That decision to follow Jesus then leads to thousands of decisions throughout your lifetime to follow Jesus. When you follow him in that way, it means that every day it becomes this question of in this given circumstance, what's Jesus say? And that's what I want to do. In this given circumstance, how, what does Jesus do? That's what I want to do. I'm saying don't underestimate the power of every courageous decision to follow Jesus. Because I find it interesting that perhaps this decision by Daniel inspired courage later because just two chapters from now, Daniel's three friends will face a decision. Will we bow and worship the statue of the king or will we be thrown into a fiery furnace? Isn't that interesting? And what we know is that in chapter three, their decision is we will not bow. It's one of the most beautiful statements of faith, I think, in the whole Bible. Because what they say is, we're not going to bow to the king. We only bow to God. You know what? You throw us into the fiery furnace, the God we know, he is able to deliver us. But, don't leave this part out. But even if he does not, we will not bow to anybody else. Woo, that is faith. People try to tell me, oh, if you have any, any ounce of, of doubt that God won't do what you're, you gotta be kidding me, read your Bible. This is tremendous faith. Our God can do it, but we know every time this is not how God works. If God chooses to deliver us, we know that he can, but even if he doesn't, we're not gonna bow to anybody else. I just wonder if the courageous act from chapter three has something to do with the one courageous decision that Daniel made in chapter one. Don't you ever underestimate the courage of one decision that you make on the people around you that you really love. And don't underestimate the power of a Daniel in your life who will make that kind of decision to help your faith continue to grow. There is a rippling effect that happens. I would question... Um, question you right now in this season in which we find ourselves. Example, parents, what, what, are you, what are you teaching your kids about how to stay faithful to God in the middle of COVID? What are you teaching your kids? What, what are you being intentional about teaching your kids about how to stay faithful to the mission that God has called you to in the middle of COVID. I'm just saying, I, I think this is a really convenient time to allow something that's super inconvenient to allow us to just take a step back and go, well, right now, this is not that important. I'm not saying you don't take precautions. I'm not saying you don't be smart. I'm not saying that you don't act in accordance with what just safety can be, but I'm saying this is the kind of moment where your kids watch and learn what truly carries the most weight in our lives. And in the middle of COVID, we can still carry out the mission of God. We can. And I'm telling you, for those of you who have little ones, for those of you who have babies, for those of you who have toddlers, promise, listen, I promise, the day is coming sooner than you think that they will be marching off to college where the goal will not be to teach them to be closer to Jesus. And so the courageous decisions that you make right now as a parent for your babies will impact later. Don't have to underestimate the power of one courageous decision to follow him. So they resolve they're not going to eat 
They're not going to eat. And we go, well, come on, is this really that big a deal? I mean, it's just some, it's some food. They're not even at home. They're like in another land. I mean, if they eat the food. Now, there were some, there were some Jewish laws in place that God had told them. It had to do with no shellfish, no pork. Uh, certain meats had to be prepared in a particular way. Never meat that was offered to another idol, that kind of thing. And we, we just go, really? I mean, is, is this really that big a deal? But what Daniel and these guys know is that what looks like this small compromise was really a symbolic gesture toward a much larger compromise of their faith. Now for us, in the new, now here we stand, Jesus has come. Now our identity is in Jesus. We'll talk about this a little more in a little bit, but now our identity is in Jesus. Our identity is not in the particular food that we eat. New Testament covers that. But for them, Jesus has not yet come. For them, God has given some particulars that identify them as his people. And some of those particulars were related to food. And so he's saying, don't eat this. I know everybody else eats this, but you don't eat this. It's almost like God knew that a day was gonna come where something as simple as some dietary restrictions were going to help his people like Daniel and the guys stand their ground of faith in the middle of a foreign land where they were being pushed away from God. It's almost like God knew. It's because he did. So in this era of time, for these guys to say to the king of Babylon, to say to the chief officials, look, we, we get... You have quite the culinary choices here, but we're going to choose to follow our God's dietary restrictions. That is a big statement. We recognize you're trying to indoctrinate us. We recognize you're trying to label us. We recognize you're trying to redefine us, but we're not drinking the Kool-Aid. And we're not going to eat your food either. It says, but the one who was in charge of them was afraid. Why is he afraid? He's afraid of the king. And so Daniel's saying, look, we want to trust our God. And this, and this official's going, well, I don't trust my king. And if you don't look good, because I'm in charge of giving you this food, if you don't look strong like the rest of the men will, he'll kill me. And so Daniel comes up with this brilliant idea of, well, just test us for 10 days. He's a sharp young man. Just test us for 10 days. Verse 15 says, at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. So what is the point of this text? Everybody eat vegetables. That drives me crazy. Can I tell you that? Can I tell there are entire books written on the Daniel diet. I don't know if you know that or not. Entire books written and sold on the Daniel diet. Now, don't get me wrong. If you like vegetables, eat vegetables. If you only want to eat vegetables, eat vegetables. But don't read this story and then tell people, the Bible says you should eat vegetables and not all that other stuff, and you'll be... That is not the point of the story. I think we make it the point of the story. Because we would rather eat vegetables than actually do the point of the story. Because the point of the story is to stand where God tells you to stand. Even when it doesn't make sense. We would rather buy a book and go on a Daniel diet than actually stand sometimes where God tells us to stand. The, the point is that this is a miracle. It's a miracle. That the king's table would have all this elaborate food. And for them to just eat what God told them to eat, it's a, it's a miracle. To attribute that to anything else is to place glory where glory doesn't belong. The glory is not in the vegetables. The glory is not in the diet. The glory is in the God who gave the instruction, gave the faith to stand, and then proved that he's God. I got excited about that. Verse 17. 
To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief officials presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You get it? He's still using Hebrew names. You picking up on that? He's not using Babylonian names. He's using Hebrew names. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. I'm sure you remember, because it was only six weeks ago or so, that I talked to you one week about how so many Christians, I think, have this mentality that, that Jesus taught us that we are in but not of the world. You, you remember that? Maybe you remember that talk. Maybe you caught it online. We are in but not of the world. That's the way we often say it. But we actually took the time to look at that story that Jesus told, and we walked away with perhaps a little different way we would declare it. What Jesus actually said was, you're not of this world, but sent into this world. That's what he said. Not just you're, not, you're, you're in it, but not of it. He says you're not of it, but you're sent into it. That's a big difference. And that's what we see happen with these guys, even long ago. As they are in exile, that they, they're not separatists. They don't just separate from the Babylonian kingdom. They don't just totally shut down and disengage. But they, they also don't go syncretistic, which means they don't just blend into the Babylonian way of thinking and acting and believing to where eventually you can't tell any difference between Daniel and his buddies and the rest of the Babylonian people. They don't do either one of those. They stand their ground with one true God and then they engage in a foreign land. They lead. They use the gifts and the abilities that God's given them. They're bright. They're sharp. They use those abilities to actually engage their eyes fixed on heaven, their hearts set on glorifying God. They stood out above the rest by the way that they served. And they're eating was a part of the evidence of their believing. So before we wrap this up today, this is just one of those, I think, times to go, okay, well, where are we at on the eating thing here? I mean, Jeff, explain that a little more. Like, how is eating attached to my believing? And like, after now Jesus has come, his death, his burial, his resurrection, what are we supposed to do with all that? Well, it's interesting that the New Testament is filled with information on it. I'm just going to pick one quick one before we, before we wrap this up today. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Here's the way the Apostle Paul states it. He says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So here's first principle. We eat for the glory of God. We eat for the glory of God. And you're like, Seriously? Yeah, that's what he says. Well, how do you eat for the glory of God? Well, the scripture reflects places like in 1 Timothy, for example. It, he's dealing with the fact that there are some people who abstain from certain foods that God actually created for them to enjoy and give thanks for. And, and Paul says to Timothy, he says, everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is to be received with thanksgiving because it's made holy by the word of God and by prayer. So here's where this question starts. All right, can we put that back up? Eat for the glory of God. How are we gonna eat for the glory of God? Here's where it starts. It starts with receiving and thanksgiving when it comes to food. In other words, both the food and the ability to eat it are given to us by God. And when we recognize that, it is a part of eating for the glory of God 
It is historically why a lot of Christians will pray before they eat a meal. Why do we do that? Is that so that we can check the box of being super spiritual and make sure we got another prayer in for the day? And No, the point is to pause. The point is to pause and say, this food, are we kidding ourselves if we think that we are the one totally behind us being able to enjoy this food? No, if there's food that even exists, who, who made that? Even if you were a part of growing the food, who gave you the strength and the ability to, to work with your hands? If you raised the money to buy the food, the Bible says who gave you the ability to make money and, and to be able to provide for the needs of your family? It is to pause and just go, let's quit kidding ourselves. The very God who gives us breath is the same God who gives us food. If there is food set before me, it's because God gave it to me and he gives me the next breath and physical ability to eat this food. God, thank you for providing for us. And so it's a part of eating for the glory of God. But it's bigger than praying before you eat. Here's where Paul goes next, verse 32. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. Even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I am not seeing my own good, but the good of many. So here's what he tells us. We eat for the glory of God and we eat in a way that honors others. He says whether they're Jews, Greeks, or people in the church, all right, which is an interesting phrase, which, which he's saying, he's assuming there are going to be people who are Christians, there are going to be people who are not Christians. He's saying it doesn't matter. Jews, Greeks, Christians, not, black, white, rich, poor, doesn't, doesn't matter. He connects honoring others to glorifying God here. Why? Because it is assumed that we are making room in our life for sharing meals with other people. It is assumed that followers of Jesus are making room in their life for sharing meals with other people. And that when we do it, it's not about our advantage on something. Some of you might remember in the New Testament, Jesus, Jesus tells them one day he's at this banquet and he takes it as an opportunity to go, will you quit inviting just all your friends to come eat with you? He's like, will you quit inviting just your boss to come eat with you so that that boss will give you a promotion? Will you quit inviting your friend that they actually have something that you want to be able to enjoy so you invite them over so you can get close enough to be able to have what they... He goes, will you quit inviting people to your benefit? And will you start inviting the poor and the cripple and the blind who can never pay you back? But he said, you'll be rewarded, but get this, in the resurrection. <laughs> He's like, the payback's not now. There's a reward, but it's later. His point was, quit doing this for you. And that's what Paul's saying in, in, in Corinthians. He's saying, will, will, you, will you imagine a world where people don't exploit the power of the table, but instead the table, a meal together, is used to truly serve others? Here's my challenge for you. This is why you'd rather do a Daniel diet. Here's my challenge for you. Most people, on average, are going to do three meals a day. Okay, even if it's not a full-fledged meal, I'm saying most people are going to do something around a breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I understand that you're the, you're the exception to the rule. Just apply it, all right? We're going to say most people are about three times a day, seven days a week. You got 21 meals a week. Is it too much for us to consider? Pick two of those 21 meals and eat with somebody else. Every week, two of those 21 meals and have dinner with somebody else or have a, look, have a cup of coffee with somebody else, just whatever you would actually be, do, do the, and I challenge you, make one of those other believers. 
It could be another person who's a Jesus follower. It could be another family who's Jesus followers. Maybe it's somebody in your church that you have never, ever gotten to know. (laughs) Have a meal with somebody who's also a follower of Jesus and share that table together. But also have a meal with somebody who's not. Somebody who doesn't know who Jesus is. I told you, some of y'all would rather eat vegetables, wouldn't you? You would rather eat vegetables. It's like, he's just saying, look, when it, when it, when make it about them, right? Honor them. You're saying to them, you are worth my time. And come on, what a bigger statement in the, in the culture in which we live today. Take the time, he says, eat together. You say, but Jeff, what about COVID, man? COVID messes this whole thing up. We can't actually sit down and eat with people. No, you can't. No, you can. You just have to set some boundaries. Early on, you got to decide what those boundaries are and how can you actually, everybody's in the same boat, so nobody's freaked out when you set boundaries. If I said to you, hey, let's have dinner, but here's how we're, we're going to do this a little differently, then we, nobody's going to be, oh, I'm so shocked. No, because that's just where we all are. Some of you know um, Don and Andrea Sutcliffe, who they lead our kids. They lead our kids' ministry. And um, during COVID, they did this thing. This is, this is so, here's what they did. They called their neighbors. Hope this holds. They called their neighbors and they said, hey, let's have dinner. Whole street. Everybody get your meal. Everybody gets their own meal. Let's go to the end of our driveways. They sat in lawn chairs. Each each family set up their own little table at the end of each driveway. And they had dinner together on their street where they could talk across the roads. That way you could talk to at least three or four people who were within voice distance and down their street. Everybody sat up their lawn chairs and had dinner smack in the middle of April, May time frame when everybody's freaking out. It went so well that when they didn't have to do that anymore, their street, people on their street asked, hey, can we keep, can we keep having dinner together? Hmm. I'm just saying it can be done. It can be done. I mean, how simple was that? How simple was that? a lawn chair and whatever you were having for dinner anyway and to the end of your driveway and you visit. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. It's especially beautiful when you understand the purpose behind all this because this is the way Paul ends it. So that they may be saved. Hmm. Suddenly food has a whole different perspective here. So here's, here's his summary. Eat for the glory of God. Eat in a way that honors others and eat knowing eternity is at stake. And to realize that one day we're gonna give an account to God. And what he's reminding us of here is this connection around a table is supposed to be a place where it's easy for relationships to deepen. It's a place that makes it easy to to, to get to the point of just saying, look, I want to tell you about this Jesus that I've come to know. He saved my life. And he can save yours too. And here's what happens. People go, well, I don't know people that well. Like, I don't don't know people that well. I would not feel comfortable, like, having that come. That's the point. The point is start with dinner. Dinner. Something powerful happens when you set the table and people just begin to eat together and you get to know each other and you're telling stories to where eventually you gain the trust to get to this place that it's not awkward at all. If you care about them, this is what you're going to share. This can happen no matter what even happens in the next few months. Everybody's like, what's going to happen? We don't know what's going to happen. Are the phases going to go back down, right? Are we going to be able to meet together? I don't know. But what can happen is this can happen. 
This can happen with our neighbors. Some of you don't know this, but at, at the smaller campuses, um, at Adrian campus, at Lewisburg campus, before COVID, we had already begun to implement a meal as a part of the worship gathering. I was like, don't tell everybody at first because everybody will go there. You know, nobody's like, but we implement a meal. So here's how it works. At Adrian, for example, they come in and they sing and they celebrate and then they take a break and everybody goes and gets their plate filled because everybody brought food because that's a part of what worship is, is everybody brings and so they brought food and, and so they worship for a while and then they take a break and they go fill up their, their, their plate and they come back down and they sit down at the table and I teach while they're eating. It's amazing how barriers tend to come down and how even it's a little easier for me to say some things when, when food is involved and there's a little less anxious feel and it's kind of amazing. God might know what he's talking about. We're working on something that we want to implement uh, here really soon where we think as things continue to progress, it's probably going to get maybe where we're going to see a few more needs in people's lives than we have so far. Um, I think everybody's kind of been holding on, and, but now with unemployment a little different and depending on what's going to happen, uh, we may begin to see a few more needs. One of the things we're working on is to pick a few areas uh, strategically where we take a specific neighborhood, whatever, and we're going we're gonna to just start going and doing a little door-to-door. -door. And I know that's kind of weird. I'll wear my mask, but here's what it's going to look like. Hi, my name's Jeff. And um, I get to be a part of um, Heart of Life Church. And we're just out today because um, we just want you to know we really do care about um, the needs that are going on in our neighborhood. And we recognize this is a really weird time. Some people are, are afraid and um, some people have more needs right now than they have before. And we just want you to know that we're going to start doing something once a week and we'll give them a particular day of the week and a particular place where every, I'm just going to make this up, all right, every Wednesday night we're going to cook hot dogs. And we want to invite you, your family, and anybody you know to just stop by, maybe on your way home from work, maybe whatever, and on that night stop by and get some hot dogs and a bag of chips for your family and that'll be one night where you don't have to worry about having to have something to prep for your family, or maybe it'll just help make it a little easier as times are tight. In fact, today, um, just a bag of chips and some hot dog buns, and I would bring a pack of hot dogs. I just didn't bring them because I would keep them cool, right? So um, nothing worse than hot hot dogs. So, so cool, a bag of hot do pack of hot dogs. You, you realize how much this is? You realize how much this is not? And for a few dollars to be able to say to our neighbors, we care about the needs going on around us. And you know what? Here's something. If you could use this, we want to leave it with you. Or if you don't, you don't feel like you, you want to take it, but you know of one of your neighbors who, who could use this, we want to give it to you and, and encourage you to give it to them and then let them know that every Wednesday for the next you know, two months, we're going to cook hot dogs. We invite. There's no strings attached. Just stop by, get a hot dog and some chips, and you'll be able to hang out with a group of people who's just trying to take care of each other. Let's see. Let's see what God does. I got one more for you before I got to be quiet, which I already need to be quiet, but this one's too good. This is a bird feeder. Um, there's another group of people within our church who are, um, even today, being very intentional about the fact that some of folks who are in long-term care facilities have not been able to be around their families for a long time. They haven't been able to see families, haven't been with anyone. And what they're finding is the way that they tend to spend their time, they look out the window. And so we got a group of people in Heart of Life who today are going to construct some bird houses. And they're working with the care facilities in, in uh, town to where some of those who are in those long care facilities, they're gonna use the shepherd's hook and, and 
a bird feeder, and they're going to make the ones that have bird. This is like a hummingbird. It's the only one I had at my house, but the ones that have the bird feed and all, and going to hang it outside their window. And it's the chance to hopefully eventually get to actually be able to interact with that, with that person. But even if you never get to interact with the person who gets to look out their window, you get to interact with the people who lead in the care facilities and for them to know that there really is a people who care. And that person who's alone can look out a window and somehow we need to tell them, look at the birds. Look at the birds. Your heavenly father feeds them. And you are more valuable than they. That's a straight quote from Jesus, Matthew chapter 6. The world needs to know. And God can even use bird food to get it done. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you can take a story so long ago, Daniel and his buddies, but the scenario is the same. A people who belong to one kingdom but are living it out in another one that is not home. So God, I'm asking that you would ignite in the hearts of your people today. God, wherever we may be today, whatever campus, online, whatever that is, God, something as simple as food. Something that, that we, we engage every, most every single day, God. We need to be reminded that eternity is at stake. And even in the middle of COVID, even in the middle of crazy circumstances, there is something weightier than this. God, don't let us just simply sleep for a while. Give us wisdom to know how to walk this carefully, to walk it wisely, to protect others as we try to engage this world. God, we don't want to be foolish. We don't want to be sinful in how we do this. But there is something greater at stake here that we need to ask you to give us courage for. It is the people around us who need to know how great you are and that you could even use a meal to do that. God, will you give us faith? Call us to action. Thank you for doing that for us. In the name of Jesus, I pray.